the plan of attack for, for all this webinar, we've, we've put it down for an hour. I think quite possibly we might be a little bit shorter than that because we want to have plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, we will be making the slides available after the session. And I think we're, I think we're recording it as well. So hopefully the recording will be available as well for anyone who's not been able to, to attend this session. So just to kind of introduce myself to anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Mike Raven. I'm your hub's sustainability manager. Um, I'm working at East Ryan York's Council. Um, I mean, kind of, as it says on the slide, I've been working construction for 16 years now. A lot of that time has been working on with your hub, particularly in managing and developing the frameworks and specialising on the sustainability side. Um, my focus, you know, in the past has been monitoring the waste data that contractors have to provide contracts you through the through the framework uh, and now we're now we're moving particularly more into the challenging the whole sort of carbon side to it and developing carbon targets and i think you know what what we'll come on to towards the end of the session is our plans for for how we're going to look at really properly measuring and monitoring carbon um output on schemes just to kind of give a give an outline to 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 the morning then and to, to introduce my, my, my fellow presenters so I'll do a fairly brief intro just kind of really talking about your hub's sustainability strategy and kind of what what, what we've done in the past which have brought which has brought us up to this point um, we've kindly been joined by two two of our partners on on the framework today so we've got Arson Brown who's the Inv principal environment manager at Wilma Dixon Construction and we've got Hannah Aston, who's environment manager at Kia Construction. So they'll both be doing sessions. Um, they'll both be doing a 10, 15 minutes of a session, just looking at how their organisation tackles sustainability carbon, so minimising environmental impact, as we're all acutely aware, the, the impact of potential impact of construction works on the environment is massive. And really, it's it's a great opportunity, we think, to, to kind of show some of the good practice that, that our framework colleagues have been have been doing. Um, and then to, to, to round off the slides, um, Nick Irving, who is the Assistant Sustainability Manager at Your Hub, I work very, very closely with, and Sahib Aragundadi, sorry, I've not put my teeth in yet. Sahib Aragundadi. So Sahib is a PhD student at Leeds Beckett University, which Your Hub are delighted to sponsor, looking specifically at the development of carbon measurement tools for the frameworks. So they'll talk a little bit about the framework's future plans for carbon monitoring and measure, measuring. Um, so, so what, why, why, why do we bang on about sustainability as part of the frameworks? Um, you know, why don't we just focus on trying to get a, as low a fee percentage as possible on, on schemes? Um, I mean, the, the, the reality is, I mean, ju just to give a bit, a bit of background and to kind of to couch where we are in, in the big scheme of things. So um in november 21 we've got the latest of the united nations climate change conferences cop 26 going to be hosted in the uk in glasgow and and the uk has made some of the most stringent commitments to carbon reduction so a headline to this is we've committed to an economy-wide reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of 68 percent by 2030 compared to 1990 levels and then net zero carbon by 2050 and then when you when you dig into the the literature behind that um, namely the government's catchily named nationally determined contribution to the United Nations framework. Um, kind of the notable elements of that is transport, energy, land usage, waste. And in other words, that means construction. That's what, that's what we do, it's all those elements that you need to deliver a construction project. Um, now, your hub has got a long-standing involvement with the UN uh, climate change conferences. Um, I think back as far as 2010, we were providing case studies on the reduction of waste and carbon um, through to this year's conference where we've got the carbon reduction code which was worked on by your hub it's the forming part of the construction leadership council's presentation on their construct zero initiative so we really do we've been involved with this for a long time this isn't just a, a bit of greenwash um, now to kind of to, to take this further and um, particularly for any um you know, I, I work at East Riding Council, you know, any, any other um, clients on the call today will be acutely aware, well, how would you, you know, how are you supposed to balance the question of sustainability versus cost for, you know, value for money is always for, forefront in your mind. So how do we justify this, uh, this 
extra value element on, on part of our schemes. Um, now, for me, I'm basically, for, certainly for anyone in the public sector who's on the course today, I'm just going to direct you to the HM Treasury's Green Book. Um, the, the guidance on evaluating projects, which really, for me, this is the gold standard that any public sector project should be evaluated against. Now, its supplementary guidance on climate change expects the project should account for climate change for increasing temperatures. It expects at least two degrees increase in all cases, and then four degrees if the project is expected to have an impact after 2030. Now, I could be totally wrong, but personally, I, I generally like to have my schemes last more than nine years. So I would expect that probably most of the people in the room have, have a similar feeling. So for me, the, the question is, is not, can we afford to do all the sustainability side of schemes, but how can you possibly justify that you're actually working to the, the UK government's procedures if, if you're not? Um, so, you know, for me, it, it should be a massive question that our our um, framework users or the councils or the public sector authorities should be worrying about. And then on to your hub. So, you know, your hub does, you know, we are helping users meet their responsibilities to mitigate the environmental impact. So since the launch of the first your hub framework, your build, the frameworks have diverted over 365,000 tonnes of waste from landfill. And then, as I say, later on, we're going to talk about our plans for increasing for increasing our environmental performance regarding carbon. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting looking at the, the the waste performance on schemes and going back to so going back a decade, where there was a lot of waste. Go, there was a lot of waste going to landfill, and now that there really isn't, it's it's an absolutely minuscule amount which ends up in landfill as part of an overall scheme. And a lot of that has been. You know, a lot of a lot of it has been the the market moving and shifting, and contractors needing to become more competitive and trying to avoid waste landfill, which is it is waste, it's wasted money. Um, but also, a lot of it has been you know working with contractors on a daily basis through the frameworks, explaining what we need to do, why we need to do it, why we need to deliver a, a better level of performance on 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 our schemes. Um, to, to show the users that we're not just ticking boxes, we are helping users meet, as far as I can see, their, their legal requirements, that you know, their expectations when it comes to, to sustainability. So that's just going to give you a little bit, a little bit of background as to the, as to the, the session and as to why your hub's looking at this. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of a break and let my friend, our friend, my partners. Um, talk a little bit so do forgive us because we just need to do a little bit of stopping sharing and starting sharing so it'll be a little bit of jumping around so apologies for that so i think we're starting off first with with Alison Brough from Wilma Dixon um so i'm going to shop start sharing and i'm hoping that Alison is able to 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 share i do apologize everyone as, 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 i think for most of us we tend to use microsoft teams when it comes to um video conferencing so zoom is better for this sort of event but i think we're just kind of getting again ahead around a little bit so take away alison thank you very much mike thank you for the um introduction good morning everybody my name is alison bruff and i'm the principal environmental manager for wilmot dixon in our northern region in my previous life i was an environmental consultant for 14 years and i worked across a range of industrial sectors um, I've now been with Wilmot Dixon for over six and a half years, and I support our projects going from Anglesey in the west across to Scarborough in the east, um, Stoke and Sheffield in the southern part of the region, right up to the Scottish border. And this support that I provide includes both environmental compliance and risk management, but also through to the delivery of our sustainability strategy that I'm going to talk you through today. So the environmental social challenges that face our world have never been greater, sort of following on from what Mike's just said. And in September 2020, Wilmot Dixon launched our next 10 year sustainability strategy entitled Now or Never. This strategy has set out our ambitions and targets and commitments over the next 10 years. So the strategy is divided into three themes, which are brilliant buildings, building lives and better planet. And each ambition is made up of a number of targets to 2030, which we are going to regularly review. And we are going to report this um, in our annual sustainable development review. So we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into the first theme, which is brilliant buildings. So the ambition of net zero carbon 
buildings deliver significant operational costs and emissions benefits that offset any potential costs. So the whole life cycle cost is the key driver here. So we're going to work with our customers to make sure that any buildings that we do deliver are highly energy efficient, that they're performed as designed when occupied, and that we maximise the renewable energy generation and thus enabling them to be net zero carbon in operation. Wilmot Dixon's adopting the UK GBC Advancing Net Zero Framework approach to net zero operational carbon, and this applies to all our projects where we've got early design responsibility. Achieving net zero carbon for our buildings is all about the balance, so we have to make sure that we can balance the energy used to run the building with renewable energy supplied from the building, either on site itself or from off site sources via the grid. And the result of that balance is net zero emission of carbon. So that means for a net zero project delivered, there are no further carbon emissions as a result of delivering that building and the customer using it. And this is a really simple version of how. The how is important because that starts to allow us to put a cost on the things. So the step, step one is about reducing the energy usage from the building. And that includes all the heating, the lighting, or any other equipment within it. And that's crucial for two reasons, because to, if you reduce the energy use, then you reduce the energy bills for the building user. But it also means that you've got to supply less energy from renewable resources to make that balance work. So delivering more projects to low energy building standards like Passive House is going to be a key focus for us going forwards carbon associated with the concrete, the steel, the cladding and any other materials that we put into that building. And we're using new digital tools across our business to evaluate and reduce the amount of embodied carbon within it. Step three, as we've said, means supplying the remaining energy we need from as much on-site renewable generation as possible, with the rest of it coming from off-site renewable grid sources. And part of our offering within the strategy is to offer our customers a capital cost-free route to on-site solar energy on our projects. And then the final and most vital step is in the net zero carbon pathway is to measure and verify both the energy used and the energy supplied once the building is in use. And that we've got to do that to make sure that our design intent matches with how the building really performs. So we do that through our energy synergy process and that's our standard way of ensuring that net zero as designed and as, and as built is verified as net zero in reality. So just to give you some examples um, of net zero carbon buildings that we've already um, delivered. So this photograph is the new visitor centre at Delamere Forest in Cheshire. So we've just um, handed this building over at the beginning of this year to Forestry England. And this building was delivered with sustainability embedded into every element of it from the design through construction and into operation. So we work with Forestry England to allow them to make fully informed decisions about their renewable solution and the cost benefit analysis and the types of suppliers and things that we were going to use on the project. And, and with them, we investigated using air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, solar PV and rainwater harvesting. So through the sort of discussions and conversations we had with them and giving them all the information um, that we had available, they chose to install eight 120 meter borehole ground source heat pumps. We put a 50 kilowatt um, solar PV array on it. Um, there was a, rainwater harvesting was installed, sustainable Sukhoi drainage systems, and then also future-proofed uh, infrastructure in the car park for future electric vehicle charging points. Also excitingly, we've got another project due to start in the autumn, which is a uh, a net zero carbon school delivered for the DFE. So this is Tarleton Academy, 20 million pound school based in Preston. So as I say, that's due to go, go to site at the, um, in the autumn of this year. So that'll be exciting to see that one develop. So as I said, we're looking, we've got our own sort of solar energy offering to help make um, the use of renewable energy more um, attractive and easy for our customers. So 
we are working with Community Energy Group to provide uh, and a PV system on the on our on our project. So the Community Energy Group would own and operate the PV system, and the renewable energy is then supplied to the building owners at a market competitive cost under a long-term power purchase agreement. And the Community Energy Group maintain all operating and maintenance responsibilities. Um, and they would work with the building user to support a range of local community and social value initiatives um, using a small portion of the funds generated by the supply agreement. So this part of the strategy we've not had um, a, a, a chance to implement yet because it's it's new to us, it's a, it's a new scheme, but we have however delivered a couple of feasibility studies for some of our customers already in the Yorkshire region. And then, as I said, the, the sort of the vital step at the end of delivering a net zero carbon building is um, making sure that there is not the, the performance gap and that we deliver buildings with zero performance gap. So energy synergy is our building performance improvement strategy. And that one principal objective of the strategy is to make sure that building performance is a success and we eliminate that performance gap. So energy synergy is a more realistic energy performance metric than energy, to tar energy targets defined by building regs, since it considers detailed unregulated loads. Predicting and monitoring the actual energy consumption of a building is vital to understanding how a building consumes energy. And energy synergy breaks down energy by end use, enabling a review of consumption by building service, fuel type, or by the error. And this information is then used to target energy reduction and optimization measures, resulting in savings in carbon emissions and energy costs. So just to give you an example of um, how successful Energy Synergy has been, um, this is the Warwick University Sports Hub. So we've worked closely with the University of Warwick and their estates and energy teams because they've both got a mutual interest in optimal energy, carbon and operating cost performance. Um, and this has led to significant energy and collaboration, which has strengthened the results seen from the energy synergy process. So the sports and wellness hub actual data is, is within 1% of the TM54 estimate. However, there's an acknowledgement that our understanding of estimating energy use in swimming pools was not as accurately, uh, not as accurate as we thought, and we've learned lessons from that. But overall, it's estimated that energy synergy delivered savings of over £40,000 and a carbon saving of 98,500 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide. And the Sport and Wellness Hub is the most energy efficient leisure centre in the UK with an EPCA rating. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, so looking next at the, the net zero embodied carbon element, the materials used in construction all have a backstory. Their extraction, manufacture and transport all create greenhouse gas emissions and the same is true when we come to deconstruct and dispose the building at the end of its life. So typically by the time a building is occupied and in use, at least 30% of a building's lifetime carbon is already accounted for. So and as we make our buildings more efficient to run, that proportion quickly increases. So eliminating carbon from the production and distribution of construction materials is a complex challenge. And a lot's going to have to change before we can build using materials, which result in no net impact in carbon emissions. We hope in time by collaborating with the right people that we can make this the norm by 2040. But we've got to start, we're starting taking action now to put us on track to meet that challenging goal. Um, so to give you an example of where we've delivered reduced embodied carbon, um, that D Delamere a visitor centre that I showed you earlier on. So we reduced the embodied carbon on that by changing it from a, a concrete structure to a timber structure. So we revisited the design and we identified that opportunity and it developed a timber framed cross laminated timber building. Um, but also reducing our carbon emissions in construction further, we use sustainably sourced grown in Britain, accredited Scottish Larch for use on the external can canopies, uh, pavers and external seating areas, which was very exciting. And then finally, the final part of it is looking at a net zero supply chain. So our supply chains are an extension of our business and without them, we can't deliver great service. So um, we 
have a target to um, ensure our supply chain achieve net zero operational carbon by 2040. So when we did some work back in 2015, it highlighted that of all our scope one, two, three carbon emissions, Wilmot Dixon actually only accounted for 1% of that and the other 99% came from our supply chain. So in terms of taking that forward um, and given the size of the challenge, for a focus up till 2030 is to work on those with the most um, impact. So our target is to have the top 30% of our category A supply chain to be net zero carbon in 2030. And we're starting off with our ground workers. As you can see, when we reassess the 2020 data, our ground workers made up 20% of the pie chart. So our commitment this year is to work with our ground workers to develop diesel reduction plans by the end of the year so that they can help contribute to that. Second element of our strategy is social value. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because as Mike said, you've previously had a presentation on social value, but a key outcome in everything we do must be to maximise our business ability to do good. In the UK, income equality remains high and people's life chances vary greatly. And these are problems that no single organisation can tackle alone. The construction industry has a massive role to play and we want to work with our with our customers and experts to fully understand what is needed and how we can deliver real long-term impact. So there are lots of ways to do this and one of our main focuses is on people facing societal or personal barriers to access good careers. Every individual is unique and every community is different so we work with our customers and take an evidence-based approach to identify particular local needs. Um, we partner with local organisations and get to know their communities and we'll work with um, like-minded companies so that together um, with our customers we can create and deliver the best outcomes. So just to give you an example, this is our Ghoul project. So Wilmot Dixon has just commenced on a new business centre and innovation hub for East Riding Council that's going to offer flexible office and workshop space for small to medium sized enterprise on the Ghoul 36 enterprise zone. Um, the Real Accelerator and Innovation Solutions Hub for, will re provide 3,200 square metres of commercial floor space made up of grade A office and workshop accommodation, quali high quality conferencing facilities and a communal cafe hub that will act as a focal point for the business park. So working with East Riding um, through their town investment strategy, um, we've built a social value plan working with local people to support this. So we're working with local councillors to identify the Your For Good project that will have the biggest impact for local residents. We're delivering a number of programmes into schools on employees, employability skills, um, careers days, digital, digital technology activities, um, educating the educators. There's a whole range of activities going on in Gill. By supporting business, our reach is greater than if we support individuals alone. So as a leader, we should be sharing our knowledge and expertise to support other businesses to prosper. And we include social value in the decision making. So just to give you an example, we're on a mission to spread the word about using social enterprises and labour and waste are big hitters for our business. So we started with with those big hitters first. And in 2020, January 2021, we mandated the use of social, social enterprise recruitment agencies for all our labour. So you can see where the um, largest spend for us this year so far is we are social enterprise. But we're also looking at using waste providers who are um, social enterprises too. So we use the National Community Wood Project right across the country and uh, Recycling Lives, who are an organisation based in Preston. From school career talks to work experience opportunities, from apprenticeships and to refurbishing community facilities, our social value activities connect us with thousands of people, but some of them need particular support. So at the end of last year, we started works on a new local authority crematorium facility with a cafe and associated landscape works. So this is the Maple Park crematorium, which is located off the A61 near Carlton, Carlton Miniot. 
Um, and this has been delivered for Hamilton Council. So um, as part of that, in terms of supporting people, we had a young person called Tiffany who lived locally and was on universal credit. And she joined us through that social enterprise, the labour agency that we talked about there, We Are Social Enterprise. And she joined us as a part-time cleaner. But she got talking to the team and her actual ambition was to be a site administrator. So six months in, we're now employing her as a part-time site administrator and we're funding her to undertake a level three business admin NVQ. And then we are social enterprise as part of their offering are all also providing mentoring to her. So the final theme within our strategy is Better Planet. And Better Planet is how we will play our part in creating a better planet for future generations by putting climate, biodiversity and resource crises at the heart of the way we do business. The extent of the challenges the planet is facing means that business as usual is no longer an option and we have to rethink our approach in order to eliminate our fossil fuel use and waste. So our planet's resources are finite. It's the same planet that will be home to the generations that follow us, yet overconsumption continues and has led to rapid rises in the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, accelerating climate change, increasing in flooding and water shortages. But it's also caused the destruction of habitats, leading to the extinction of many plants and species and animals. So we've got to rethink our approach and how we build in order to eliminate our fossil fuel use, maximise our resource efficiency and enhance natural environments. As such, we've set ourselves the ambition of being a net zero carbon company without offsetting by 2030. Unless we radically change our direct contribution to climate change and play our part in limiting global warming to within one and a half degrees, we're all going to experience dramatic changes to our lives. We've been successful in tackling our carbon emissions for the last 10 years and since 2012 we've been net zero carbon in our own operations, but we've done this by investing in verified carbon reduction projects overseas to offset our own emissions. We're now going to go further and become zero carbon in our operations, reducing our own emissions to zero so that we will no longer need to offset our carbon footprint. Just done that one. Super. So how are we going to get there? So we're going to do it through a number of measures. So business mileage reduction is set on a 2018 base level. And prior to COVID in 2021, we targeted a 15% reduction for this year. But as a result of the behavioural change within the organisation, we've increased that target to 50%, which is quite a challenge. So we've got to get from 3.8 million miles in 2018 down to 1.9 million in 2021. And I think even if we achieve a 40% reduction, we've still gone a long way and done really well. We've also changed our company car scheme this year um, to make it easier for our people to access electric vehicles. And so far in the North alone with the scheme changing in January, we've had over 30 of our people requesting all electric company cars. The other big part of it is us reducing diesel on our sites. Um, and eliminating it ultimately. So the same challenge that we've set our supply chain, we've also set ourselves. So at the moment, we are transitioning our sites and hopefully our supply chain onto HVO instead. So whilst that still um, attracts carbon emissions, it's 90% it's less than red diesel. So going back to the project at Hamilton, that project's running on a hybrid generator and they're using HVO fuel there to reduce the carbon emissions from its operation. We try and get grid connection on our sites as early as possible, but that, that's um, not always possible, especially at Hambleton due to its rural location. But where we do have grid connection, we source our um, temporary builder supply through a social enterprise called Planet First and they guarantee us 100% renewable power to our projects. Another key ambition we've set ourselves is to generate zero avoidable waste. What is avoidable waste? Well, the Green Construction Board defines avoidable waste in construction as preventing waste being generated at every stage of a project's life cycle, from the manufacture of the materials and products, to the design, specification, procurement and assembly of buildings, through to recovering materials and products at deconstruction. It's really important for us to shift the mindset of waste from being seen 
as a sustainability or an environmental issue once on site and to start seeing it as something that needs to be considered at every stage and by all our teams. So how will we get there? Well, we're introducing, a, we're furthering the use of waste elimination and reduction plans. And the challenge is to try and prevent waste actually coming to site. So we're challenging both our supply chain partners and our manufacturers about them understanding and providing us with details on what they're what they are bringing to site. One of our biggest waste sources on site is pallets, uh, timber pallets, and often um, by the time the pallet arrives, it, it's not much use for uh, further use. So our Dixon School project and lead trialed the use of plastic pallets. So they purchased some plastic pallets and that was used for the brick package and another material storage throughout the, the life of that project. And because of their robustness, those pallets have now been transport, transferred to our Melton Police Support Project in Hull. So we've eliminated waste um, through the use of pallets. What we're trying to do is look for reuse options and not single use options. So we've um, had our, we've got our Think Outside the Skip initiative. So challenging everybody on site, if we didn't have skips on site, how would you manage the waste or what else would you do with it? We're all, as I said, we're also challenging our manufacturers. So one of our lighting manufacturers offers us plastic crates, which are returnable rather than multiple different cardboard boxes and light fittings wrapped in cardboard and plastic wrap, it now comes in one plastic crate, which is returned at the end of the end of the use, which is really good. So it's those kind of initiatives that we're looking to take forward with, with all our manufacturers. Um, and the final elements then of, of Better Planet are about delivering environmental net gain and having the volume of water use that we use on our project. Our environment has never been under so much pressure and at the same time our appreciation of the importance of nature and how it can improve our mental well-being and help bring communities together has never been greater and I think the sort of lockdown last year really showed that and emphasised that. The built environment has an important part to play in restoring our environment and bringing nature into communities. So as well as this, we'll invest in planting trees to support our customers and their local communities to tackle climate change and create green spaces for people and nature. So in terms of delivering net gain, what, how will we get there? I think the big change for us is that we've never really measured the biodiversity value of a site before. Um, so now we will start measuring the biodiversity value before we start, but then also looking at what the design value will be by the time we finish. And we want to ensure we achieve an increase in, in value uh, going forward. So we've got a pilot project in 2021 to see if we can achieve that and deliver on that. Um, and then in terms of having water, water use on our projects, it sounds daft, but we've got to understand where we use water and I don't think we've ever had a full appreciation of the volume of water we use for certain activities. So we're looking at innovating on water reduction technologies. So on a couple of our projects, we've now tried spraying on plaster rather than the traditional um, plastering process. But we're also looking and challenging ourselves on when we actually need to use potable water and reusing water for other purposes. So for example, we've got a project which has a large wheel wash bath system on site. So instead of filling that wheel wash bath with potable drinking water, quality standard water, they're using their concrete washout water. So once the concrete washout water has been treated, they're using that to fill the bath. And it's just looking, looking at options and opportunities like that, that we hope to be able to reduce our volume of water on site. And that's me. Thank you very much. No, that's brilliant. No, thanks for Alison. That's been, that's been really good. Um, I, should, I, I meant to say at the start, and totally forgot, if anyone's got any questions, um, there's a Q&A box, so feel free to, to drop them in, in there. Um, and we'll try and pick those up at, at the end, just depending on, on time. So um, with no further ado, I'll, I'll let Hannah introduce herself and go through a little bit of, of the, the great practice the key has been delivering. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hannah Aston, and I work for Keir Construction in the North and Scotland Regional Building Section. I started my career uh, working for the Department of Environment 
and implementing its environmental management systems. And we were the 18th country, um, 18th uh, organization to in the country to achieve accreditation to ISO 14001. Following that, I worked for the Environment Agency uh, to support them in ensuring they practiced what they preached and worked with the regulatory team to ensure the EA's offices, depots and organizations and operations met the same standards that they were enforcing. I moved into the construction sector about 15 years ago whilst working as a consultant, but since then I've worked for a number of major contractors in implementing both environmental and sustainability solutions in both the infrastructure and the construction sector. The key understands that sustainability is a mindset which safeguards three vital features that no business can operate successfully without a resilient environment, a resilient community and a resilient balance sheet. Kia launched its framework Building for a Sustainable World in July 2020, which replaced our 30 by 30 strategy. And the strategy covers 10 key areas in both environmental and social topics. And I'm only going to cover the environmental side today. Uh, within that side, we look at pollution prevention, sustainable procurement, carbon impact, zero waste, and protection of habitats and resources. So very similar areas as to what Alison was discussing. We are currently collating our first year's data to um, assess our performance and entering into our second year to work towards our targets, which include preventing pollution from our operations within our control, taking a life cycle approach to sourcing materials, products and services, achieving net zero carbon across our own operations and our supply chain by 2045, not producing avoidable waste by 2035 and being single use plastic free by 2030. And finally, ensuring our operations will maintain a healthy environment for future generations. Ooh. So in 2019, the UK government announced um, an emergency climate and uh, set the net zero target for 2050. And in response, the majority of construction companies have now announced net zero targets. And each, tar each company has their own different target dates, some as soon as 2025, others as 2050. Uh, and but Kira set their target at 2045. And we often get asked why that target date might be later um, in comparison to some of our competitors. Um, and sometimes this comes down to the carbon emission sources that we are capturing. Um, so if a, 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 a organization has an earlier carbon date, they may be capturing fewer emissions and trying to reduce those. So our approach is 100% of our carbon footprint. So we're going to be looking at scopes one, two and three. And therefore, with more included in our target, we will inevitably take more time to achieve net zero. So for those with looking at scopes one, two and three and who aren't familiar with those, uh, scope one is our fuel we use in our sites and offices and in our company cars. Scope two is the electricity we use in our offices and on our temporary sites. Um, and the vast majority is uh, in our scope three emissions. So that's the energy used um, and carbon emitted from as it is for most of our other organizations is within the value chain. Um, and these also include public transport, waste, materials, products, water, uh, employees and subcontractors and supply chain. We have defined our scopes in line with the NCORD protocol, which translates carbon uh, categories laid out in the greenhouse gas protocol for the construction sector. Our steps to net zero looks at four different categories, all of which cover the three scopes. We've got embodied net zero, which looks at the materials we use to build and maximizing the site one resources such as demolition or excavation waste. Net zero operations for the buildings, which consider the impacts of the buildings that we have once in use. What our impact is for construction net zero, so how we can reduce our carbon while building. And the end of life carbon impact helps us to consider the carbon impacts at the building's life, end of life and how it can be disassembled, deconstructed or reused. 
So these um, these four areas, we have our set our pathways uh, to net zero, and it covers um, a number of each of them might fall into different categories. But by 2030, we will have 100% electric vehicles, 100% renewable energy, net zero offices, and we'll achieve a 65% reduction in our operations carbon and a 40% reduction in our embodied carbon. By 2039, we will have net zero business carbon with no offsetting and by 2045, net zero value chain. At Kia, offsetting is a last step and will not be prioritised over making real reductions in carbon emissions, as we believe if this were to happen, offsetting could become a licence to pollute instead of actually driving real change. We also report on these on an annual basis and uh, we have uh, Energize as our independent third party to verify our data. To support Kia's pathway to net zero, we have committed to climate uh, set climate targets in line with limiting global temperature rise to one and a half degrees. And we are listed as a signatory on the science-based targets initiative uh, and also with the UN global website. And through these commitments, we've also become part of the Race to Zero campaign. We have started our journey and over the last year, we have focused on construction net zero, which includes a combination of various one, two and three emissions. These are emissions related specifically to the delivery of the projects and our own offices. Uh, so it's the fuel used on sites by us, our song contractors, company cars and electricity, but it currently excludes the carbon emissions from extracting, processing, transporting and um, manufacture of materials. We are also um, working with our, uh, with our clients to implement and build passive house uh, schemes as well to look at the, the um, embodied carbon. But uh, we have started our, our journey with the areas where we can influence where we, it's possible. So we have already installed EV charging points at our offices and sites. Uh, we have uh, procurement purchases in place to purchase renewable energy. And we are working with our supply chain and subcontractors and in instigating low energy options. We've also started to gather our baseline data for all our scope three carbon emissions, which is a real task in itself. And over the next coming months, we will now be starting to target these emissions in a more focused fashion and ensure that as we work towards these uh, targets, uh, long term targets, we will start to implement them and look at design and life cycle analysis uh, and, and include our clients in these decisions. We have already taken a number of steps at looking at our own supply, but we can't achieve the targets by ourselves. And we are also working with our subcontractors and supply chain uh, to bring them on the journey with us. So I'm just going to cover a couple of initiatives that we have implemented on our sites already to help us achieve building for a sustainable world. And like Alison said, at some sites, we can't always get a, an early electricity supply or electricity supply at all. And so we have to use cranes with generators and uh, because we can't get the ele electricity to supply them. Um, a generator generally works efficiently between 60 and 90% load. And a crane generator generally only operates within this factor at about 10% of the time. The rest of the time it's running at about five to 10% load. And this is wasting fuel, putting on extra maintenance onto the generator and causing the site team problems as it has a tendency to break down and, or emit black smoke. So to try and resolve this issue and reduce our scope one carbon emissions, we have worked with our supply chain and partner Sunbelt Rentals and with Flybrid Technology and have installed a prototype flywheel at our site. This was a UK first, which has now been in place for over six months and has provided crucial data to, for the development of the product, which is now available for all to use. The innovation is derived from similar technology used in Formula One and is a flywheel energy storage system, which can be used to capture energy from the generator, which would normally be wasted and stored in a high speed energy storage flywheel. The recuperated energy can then be used to help power the generator, thus improving performance and allowing the crane to have enough power at peak times. 
we've had some fantastic results and the, the trial has been really successful. We could drop the generator size from a 325 um, kVA down to a 150, which meant the generator ran more efficiency for a longer duration, which has prevented breakdowns, smoky emissions, which is, means that it's better for our local communities as there is less air pollution or less vehicle movements from the maintenance team. We've also shown a reduction in fuel on site, which lowered our carbon emissions and also the emissions from transporting the fuel. And this equates to a 40% saving, which we've estimated about £300 a month. The site team have been so pleased with the results. So it's taken the trial one step further now, and we are starting to use hydro-treated vegetable oil or HVO, and this will help us reduce our carbon emissions by a further 90%. The manufacturer has now put the flywheel into production and it, they, it's now a smaller version, so not quite as big as the one we've got, but it still does the same uh, job and it's available for anyone to use across the industry. And it can be used for different applications such as hoists. It doesn't just have to be used for cranes. Uh, also touching on waste, um, at our Pontine and Leisure Centre, where we are building a range of community facilities, including two new schools, uh, a swimming pool, climbing wall, soft play centre, gym, uh, 3G pitch, cafe library and community site, uh, fire station. And um, the site team there wanted to look at two elements of um, how they can divert waste from landfill. Um, and they wanted to look at it uh, both in the office and out on site. So they thought they'd start with single use plastic in the office um, and promoting um, employing a local family business to run the canteen facilities. Though canteen waste is, is not our largest waste stream, it's an area which is easy for us to manage as it's, it's in, our, in our direct control. And the site team had witnessed um, the amount of single use plastic being generated on site from previous projects from canteen waste and wanted to do something about it, um, especially with the recent campaigns that have been um, on, on the television, etc. And so they also wanted to work with the local community and workforce and provide them with canteen facilities for the site team to use in the day. Um, so the, also the site team decided on the construction phase that they wanted to use quality protocol recycled aggregates wherever they could to prevent demolition material going to, to landfill. And with the added bonus that the quality protocol material has a better standard than the usual recycled aggregate with less class X materials because it's got a far better testing regime in place and um, to provide the qualification to the quality protocol um, verification. So to help uh, reduce our scope three carbon emissions from the waste produced on site and provide social value to the local community, the site team worked with the local family owned business to run the site based canteen and together they implemented a number of ideas. The project management is driven to improve the well-being on site and provide those canteen facilities. Um, and to eliminate single-use plastic, each employee is given an aluminium bottle during the site induction, while the site team explains the reason behind it and the environmental benefits of reducing plastic. It's not just for key employees, it's for everyone that comes to site. And this promoted a, a positive feeling of being part of a bigger cause. In order to fill the bottles up, a Cal Maxi water filtration system was used and there were benefits in this because it reduced the chlorine, combated problems with sediment, dirt, discoloration, etc. It can, sometimes can come through tap water um, and it uh, apparently tastes much nicer as well, according to some of the site team. And this eliminated the floor standing bottles and water coolers, etc. and the sanity uh, kits that are needed when using these facilities. Uh, every uh, user of the aluminium bottles also benefited because they could take them home and use them for sporting um, elements afterwards to help with their well-being. Canteen waste has re been reduced and no plastic cups or bottles were being generated on the site. And by undertaking these measures, it was estimated that a 60% cost saving was implemented um, against if you're looking at, looking at uh, drinking water bottles and uh, plastic cups and the cost of waste associated with this.
In addition, by working with Jan's Kitchen, the catering business, this has doubled in size and new full-time and part-time positions has come in place. And Jan worked with local suppliers for the food and drinks. And even with the new COVID requirements we have in place, she's taken on board and has now used compostable takeaway boxes, cups and wooden cutlery rather than reverting back to plastic cutlery. And so this has further helped us reduce our plastic. Um, by providing a variety of healthy and traditional meals, her kitchen has uh, reduced the number of trips in vehicles that the site team may take during the breaks um, to obtain hot drinks and food. And we've estimated that this reduces our, uh, 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 our carbon footprint by the site at least by 25%. So that was a very quick run through because we only had a very short time and so I've only covered a couple of initiatives but um, if, if we had longer I, I would like to have covered more but um, if, if anyone has any questions after at the end that would be great. Thank you. No, that's great. Thanks very much for that Hannah. Um, okay so you, you've, you've seen a couple of presentations now for, from our, our former partners so I'm just going to pop back up the the your hub slides and um, Nick and Zahib will take us through the 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 last part of the presentation, which is really talking about the our plans. If I can just work out how to share my screen again. I had all this working perfectly, and now all, all my controls have vanished. Exit minimize video. That's it. Share screen. That's what I need. Everyone knows it's highly professional. I'm just fiddling about here, but yeah. So okay, okay. Um, morning, everybody. I'm going to really quickly rattle through my two slides and uh, get Sahib as much time as possible. So. Nick Irvin, Assistant Sustainability Manager for Your Hub, also Senior Project Manager for East Riding and Yorkshire Council. Um, I've been in construction for about five years, uh, started on the uh, contractor side, now working more on the client side, so I've got a bit of an overview on um, different aspects of, of sustainability. Um, next slide, please. So, um, your hub have been working on carbon reduction measures for a couple of years now. Um, we did trial a carbon KPI back in 2018, which looks at scope one and two emissions. And there were eight uh, participants in that trial. So the feedback was generally positive, but it did highlight the challenges and issues with establishing um, baseline data and how we draw reasonable and meaningful conclusions um, between different types of projects. And that for me really just uh, identifies the limitations of doing localised, small scale trials. So this is something which the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction and the National Association of Construction Frameworks are currently working on. And things are moving rapidly with both of those organisations. We've just recently received from the NACF a draft carbon code KPI, which we will be looking to bring into the Your Hub framework. And we should be able to share more on that in the near future, just ahead of the Your Build and Your Civils 3 frameworks, which are due to come out early in the next year. So the benefits of your hub working with Cambridge and the NACF is that we can begin to pool all of our resources, all of that data and, and, and sort of establish a really, ro really robust data set that will give us all, um, you know, a, a better foundation to work from. So to take that a step further, your hub have sponsored Sahib, who is a PhD student at Leeds Beckett University. He's looking at the creation and implementation of KPIs with a focus on behaviour. Um, something which is very interesting to me personally, as I say, I've come from a, a contractor's background, so I've seen different behaviours on different sides of the coin. So, yeah, quick, quick one there. I'll pass over to Sahib, give you the most time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, for that uh, brief introduction. And I'm conscious of the time. We have very limited time. So, um, Basically, uh, we're going to be using KPI to be able to drive this uh, behavioral change in carbon on construction site, right? Uh, next slide. And this is the uh, supposed uh, framework that I'm going to be using to develop the KPI. And uh, just to breeze through it, I'm going to be doing some uh, stakeholders mapping and identification, which I believe uh, 
most people on this call today would uh, be contacted for that. And basically what we're trying to do with this is to be able to identify the people that are capable of influencing carbon uh, reduction during construction process. And uh, we would then look at uh, the construction process altogether and look at which, which uh, areas actually emit carbon. And this will lead to uh, identifying carbon hotspots, uh, whereby we'll look at uh, the areas that aid the most carbon uh, during construction process. And uh, the stakeholders that we've identified in step one will then be brought together in a focus group to be able to develop this KPI. And this is to ensure that this KPI is fit for purpose and uh, to ensure that it's driving the necessary reduction in carbon during construction uh, process. Uh, next slide, Nick. And uh, this is just the brief uh, time scale for that. Uh, looking at uh, de delivering that within one year, uh, that is uh, from recruiting the contracting organization, identifying stakeholders, developing the KPI, testing the KPI, and improving the tested KPI as it were. Uh, once uh, they are being uh, developed. Uh, next slide, Nick. And uh, thank you very much. I would have loved to talk more about this, but because of the time, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this is my contact details. I'm willing to uh, take the conversation forward with uh, anyone that is interested and uh, kindly do uh, watch out for me reaching out to you very soon. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Sahib. So, yeah, I mean, just to kind of say, you know, we, we, we've, as kind of just a little bit broader, we've 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 surveyed our framework users. They've fed back that the the sustainability strategy that we we've, we've had within the frameworks in the past, they definitely want that to continue. So that kind of feeds into why we're, we're pushing forward in in terms of the carbon KPI and expecting our framework partners to to do more on, on that. So we, we are really trying to link link with the, the likes of the people on the call today and and link with others to, to make sure the firm is delivering what what you guys need um and i, I think so sort of touch wood we're, we're kind of doing that now i'm not sure if we've had anything in terms of questions um a couple of things that i did want to just kind of pick up on which um i'll i'll, I'll throw, throw up panelists um i mean i mean first hannah I'm a massive geek, so I'm just I'm fascinated by the punch fly flybridge fly, flywheel. I think that's such an amazing thing. I don't I don't really have any questions, but it's it's such an it's such an awesome thing that and it's something different. Yeah. It it's been I mean the there were because it was a you know UK first, there were teething problems the first couple of days, but since then it nothing's broken down. It's been absolutely brilliant. And the site teams will be the first to say, now I'm not using that. It, it, you know, it's rubbish when we do trials. Mm. But they have been blown away by it. And uh, now we're moving on to hydrogen vegetable oil as well for it. That's just it's just a double win. So mm. it's great, phenomenal. No, de definitely. It's it's one of the things that, you know, my, Obviously, my team do do a lot of work delivering projects as well as our sustainability side for your hub, um, and so you work. You know, I know my team's working both with, with both contractors on the call today, and you know, it really it really just get driven home that it isn't just delivering another construction project. It is genuinely both your organisations do have this this you know, integrated. Um, desire to, to go for further in terms of sustainability, which is exactly what, what I feel that we as, as a client and other clients on the call say need. So, so no, that's, that's brilliant. Um, also, I know, I know on yours, there was a, one of the things that I particularly liked was the, the energy synergy service um, that was mentioned in terms of, you know, so trying to sort of reduce the gap between the plan performance and the actual performance. And that, that's something that I always think it's always a massive question for me, and I've seen slides in the past before the show that even on a on a good job, you've got a ten percent gap in performance between what was planned and what is real. What is real? Um, uh, I know again. I mean, that one of the schemes that you showed there was was the Gold Business Centre, which I'm managing, and I know from my site supervisors visiting Gold how few issues they're identifying. You know, probably a lot less issues than than maybe we've seen on other projects. So it's clear to see that the your teams are geared up to you know they want to do stuff right, they want to use the right quality materials, and they want to make sure that there isn't any defects. And and that's the right answer because long term, you know, the defects one it 
defects are not everyone. And secondly, it's, it's, it's wasted profit if, if for no other reason than that. And um, it's waste. You do it right first time and then you don't generate the waste as well, not just the, the carbon, but also the physical waste. No, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I know, we'll, you know we're, we're so very pleased again, again to work, work with both of yourselves. Um, I'm mean, always kind of say wooden pallets. My dad has a coal fire, so he will happily accept any wooden pallets that people don't want in whatever condition. Um, I probably shouldn't say that because he's from Ghana, will be full of pallets. But um, but but no, I, th I think I think it's it's really good what you know what both of yourselves are doing, and I know it's, at Easter Island we're very pleased to be working with yourselves. Um, I think you know the, the other thing I want to just kind of touch on briefly. So 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 hey with. Um, with kind of the, the the plans that you've got to in terms of de developing the KPIs. So I know you're looking at um, undertaking various focus groups with like targeted contractors through the frameworks. So, and I think we're looking at both sort of the small and the large of the contractors. So Adam and Alison, you'll probably get dragged into doing some sessions with us in, in the not too far distant future. Um, I guess, and um, you know, it's, it's just, just kind of throwing a question at you, Steve. What, what do you think is the most, the most challenging element of this of trying to make a carbon KPI successful? Uh, well, I would say that it's two. Okay, the first, the first one is um, the application of the, of the KPI once developed. Because uh, so in the industry, KPI has been uh, misconstrued to not drive the necessary behavioral change or the necessary thing that is supposed to drive. And uh, it's been discovered that that's because of how the KPIs are being uh, captured and measured during uh, its application. So uh, one of the things that uh, this project is going to try to work on is to ensure that uh, the KPI that are developed are actually implemented and utilized as a spot that is uh, necessary so that the, the KPIs don't become something that uh, becomes a, a lagging uh, indicator as it were. And uh, secondly, it's going to be that uh, within, the, within the construction industry generally as well, uh, KPIs have actually been utilized for to capture quality, time, uh, client satisfaction and, and the rest, right? And um, you will see that in the environmental side, uh, there's been there there's not been much of uh, those sort of KPIs uh, being developed. So uh, I I think that that might be a challenge in in the sense that how to first adopt those KPIs after it gets developed. So that that's another challenge. But uh, hopefully, uh, once um, the research is done. Uh, are, we are going to be identifying the uh, necessary um, behavior within the contracting framework that uh, this KPI can actually be um, infused into to ensure that is smooth. Into I mean, it's, it's smooth for the uh, contractors to be able to adopt during uh, their general uh, performance uh, measurement while on site. No, that, that, that's that's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the things that you know we, we've obviously been t been talking in the in the recent months about the K the KPI and particularly with the frameworks, we, we have a whole range of contractors. You know, we work from you know quite um, quite small contractors to you know to, to obviously large ones like like Kieran Wilmer Dixon on the call today, and it's trying to find a how you how you how you can make it work for all contractors. Um, and that, Alison and Hannah, one, one thing that I'd be interested to, to hear from yourselves, obviously, Sahib's talking about the, the behavioural challenges there. You know, do, does, does that have any, any kind, do you have any thoughts on how that can be, be tackled? Uh, for us, it's uh, just raising awareness and getting people to understand the issues. We first, when we first started uh, approaching our supply chain, and um, we were asking them to trial new technologies and um uh, new initiatives. Uh, we had some initial uh, resentment or not resentment feedback because um, the they're not used, they don't understand the technology to the full and they, they you know, foresaw problems that might actually not be there. So it's about bringing people online and giving them the information they need up front to calm their fears, really, I suppose. Um, once they 
grasped it and looked where we were going, they, 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 they just ran with it because they understood that it actually helps them for future generations and future bids with not just Kia, but with other companies as well. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's raising awareness and, and giving them the full picture of, of the technology that you're trying to encourage them to use. I completely agree with Hannah. For us, it's about bringing them on the, the journey with us. I think this is a phrase we both used in our presentations, but it's it's sort of, we're we're still learning and they're learning too, and we've just got to help each other. And and you're going to make mistakes and you may not get it right first time, but but that's okay. Do you know we, we try again? Yeah, and that's why it's important to keep trialing these new initiatives. We, we you know, at the moment the technology is not necessarily there how we're going to get to carbon zero. So if we don't try we will never know so there that you know there is always that hesitancy but you know where they're using their own plant and equipment it, you know they've got to think about how they safeguard that themselves so it's it's you know it it's proving to them that things have worked in the past so we've done a number of case studies and we've proved it to th that we've used it so if we can use it then they can use it so that's nice brilliant okay um well i think I don't think we've got any other any other questions, so um, I think we'll maybe bring the bring the session to an end there. Um, I mean, I, hopefully that the people who've been on the call today have found it of use. I know I've certainly I've certainly found some interesting gems out of it. So th thank you to both of our our um, front partners for taking the time to present to us today. Um, and I think that's it. So thanks again for your time, guys, and I hope everyone has a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, everyone. All right.